welcome to another episode of Global Forum. Today's reflection is on what German theologian Hans Kung has said, there can be no peace among nations without peace among religions. Can interfaith dialogue really contribute to world peace, amity among nations, good relationship among neighbors? That's the question we need to discuss today, we want to discuss today in its many dimensions and many subtleties with our two distinguished guests. We have here Father Francis Tizo, who is a director of Interfaith Dialogue within the Catholic Church, and we also have Muhammad Al Sanusi, who is director of communications and community affairs with ISNA, Islamic Society of North America. And both of them have been involved with this enterprise for a long time. I welcome you both. Father Tizo, let me ask you a simple question for people who may not be familiar with this enterprise. What is Interfaith Dialogue? This is when people get together to talk about religious differences and similarities. Right? It could be as simple as that, uh, a gathering around a kitchen table. Uh, or it could be as complicated as choosing uh, specialists uh, from the different religious traditions and gathering over a period of time to work out more complex issues. Uh, it can take a great many forms. Of course, it could even simply be living in a neighborhood productively where there was a diversity of religions and occasionally gathering for social events. So there is a vast gamut of possibilities here. Usually what I like to say is that interreligious dialogue is when the representatives of a religious community get together at that cutting edge of exchange of ideas that is productive and at the service of the communities from which they come and which they represent. Okay, productive dialogue at the service of their respective communities. Is that your experience? Uh, of course it is. Um, our very example with the Catholic Church itself, uh, we held an interfaith, or I call it interreligious dialogue for the last nine years. Um, uh, scholars from the Muslim community <coughs> and from the Catholic Church get together and discuss issues to uh, bring the community together. They discuss issue has to do with revelations, they discuss issue has to do with, with uh, family issue, family values, and even with the violence issues that is in, in both uh, re religions. And I think this kind of dialogue, when it go down to the masses, to the grassroots level, it will give the uh, community um, a level of comfort, how to deal with your neighbors, how to um, arrange a joint, you know, uh, programs and projects that, you know, benefit the, the society at large, regardless uh, specific religion. So therefore, it is partly looking at religion as culture and making neighbors understand each other's culture, if I understand you correctly. Uh, that, that's, just, I mean, re religion, of course, um, you, in the polaristic society, like the U.S. society, you will find people that adhere to uh, to certain religions, and you will find people that uh, with no religion. So you have to find a common ground to bring all the humanity together. But it seems like in an interfaith dialogue, one also looks at the notion of uh, Irish Catholics as opposed to German Catholics where they not only have a component in common, but there are uncommon components that they have to discover about each other. So if I understand you correctly, then there are two or three main components of interfaith dialogue. One is the element of discovery, discovery of mutuality. Second is the aspect of problem solving. And third could be the aspect of mutual product, mutual benefit. Would you say those are the aspects that are available for that reason? Yeah, one of the areas that's very important is that since, for the most part, even leadership is not well informed about the basic beliefs of the other religions. And these provide an opportunity even to learn the basics, right? And to learn the basics in a way that is congenial to developing a relationship. So that it's not just reading a book about Islam, but actually speaking with Muslims and uh, getting their perspective on things and seeing how, for example, uh, I said this years ago, what you read about Buddhism in the Pali scriptures and how Buddhism is lived in Sri Lanka or in Thailand can be quite different. And so someone who had only done one and not the other would not really understand the whole picture of Buddhism. And the same thing is true, I think, uh, in, in, in many, many settings. You have the same problem, Judaism in the Old Testament versus mm -hmm. Judaism as it is lived today. Uh, Catholicism is an enormously complicated religion, so it's better to know a variety of Catholics in order to be able to talk about Catholicism well 
educate about Catholicism if you are not a Catholic, and to engage in uh, constructive projects uh, with, with Catholics so that you know how Catholicism really works. You know, think of the famous problems of papal infallibility. It doesn't apply to everything the Pope says. You, know? you have to know those things through contact and through sharing. Right. Very well said. While I appreciate the precision with which you answered the question, uh, but is it the only reason people engage in interfaith dialogue because they want to get better understanding and have ecumenical outreach or are there other motivations that people... What are some of the main motivations for which people are engaging in interfaith dialogue? Well, I think, I think solving problems, I think it is a main motivation. I will give you an example. For example, the issue of torture. Mm -hmm. uh, this particular issue has created a huge problem, not, in, not only in the United States, even in the, the entire globe. Um, uh, our experience at the Islamic Society of North America in December of 2005, we uh, helped to, uh, to organize a conference just to talk about the issue of torture and human rights. And that conference, uh, in fact, um, was able to produce an organization called National Religious Campaign Against Torture. This organization, now it is an interreligious organization, it has now 120 religious organizations, uh, evangelical, Southern Baptist, um, uh, you know, all kind of religion, I mean, Protestant and Catholic and others, um, because the cause itself is a very noble cause. They wanted to eradicate torture. And, 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 and the grassroots organization now, we are able to have uh, an executive director, we are able to hire four or five people, we are able to open headquarters in, in, in Washington within only 18 months. So I think because of the support from the from the from the community, interreligious community, the organization is moving forward. Uh, now, only 18 months, you have a powerful organizations, uh, even getting award from the United Nations. So I think because of the, the religious motivations, we are solving a particular problem when the interfaith or interreligious people get together. So it will have been a correct impression by my part that interreligious dialogue is becoming an important instrument of the emerging international civil society. Instead of settling issues by force or by legal decree mm -hmm. or by institutional enforcement, this is a, a spiritual and a moral dimension on which things are sought. So it is like it will be akin to applying moral force to solve political problems and social problems. Will you say that's the case? You have an organization like the World Conference of Religions for Peace, which has been in existence now in a number of decades, doing exactly this. And it provides a kind of interface between policy makers and the general communities of religions, people on the streets who are believers, who are practicing their faiths. Now, a recent example, uh, similar to the, the uh, anti-torture right. movement within the United States, would be the Six Powers uh, discussions around North Korea and nuclear policy in the Far East. And that is being spearheaded on the spiritual level by World Conference of Religions for Peace based in Japan. So you have Japan, North and South Korea, Russia, China, and the United States working together, that is religious leaders from those countries, working together to try to direct or influence policy makers on the one hand and also deliver a message to the general public. This is the kind of way that we work. This idea of an interface between the international community and communities of faith is a crucial one, so that every so that ideas will be accepted, that ideas will be debated on the local level and become part of the currency of thought. What about skeptics uh, who would say, in what debating issues are in no position to deliver on those discussions? You know, they may be interfaith dialogue on behalf of a particular community in South Asia or Middle East. But the people who are negotiating on their behalf have no power to deliver on their behalf. So it is more an exercise in feeling good than to really sort of solve any issues. What about that? Well, um, we, we have to understand is that uh, there is a lot of uh, common grounds between um, the Abrahamic faith 
and um, you know as a Muslim community uh, for the past uh, decade or so um, the interfaith uh, dialogue it was only you know exchanging kind of courtesy issue uh, things and things like that but now I think we're entering a different phase and that is a phase of partnering in a specific project that you know uh, deliver actually uh, obvious products um, so, so I think that is where the Muslim community is, uh, is, is, is there. Um, internationally, um, the Muslim community at the international level, we just hosted actually um, a group from the Middle East for, from four countries, Syria, Saudi Arabia, Egypt and Jordan. And we exposed them to the, to, the, to, the, to, to the interfaith projects that the Muslim community is doing here. As a mean, they can, when they go back, they can adopt these kind of models uh, to solve their own problems. So, so I think that is a greater benefit for the society at large. But when we are, what I want to learn from both of you is, where is the area of optimal effectiveness in terms of interlaced dialogue? What areas it succeeds best? And where are the areas which it doesn't have that kind of a great outcome as yet? I think we're able to produce uh, documents and sometimes even talking points for leadership to deliver a message and press releases, that kind of thing. And then those instruments uh, can be circulated through the, through the web, for example, through publications and so forth. And then people can draw upon that. And the, uh, the real challenge here is when you see an issue, let's take the recent debate on immigration. Uh, you know, we still have hopes that somehow we'll find our way out of this labyrinth, but uh, the religious communities did try their best. The politics that prevailed were more the politics of obstruction rather than the politics of construction. We tried to be constructors of that approach through uh, legal immigration uh, clinics and through uh, different kinds of seminars, training of leadership, and so on. Uh, for the moment, it wasn't as effective as we had hoped. So we admit you know, that there are some limits here. In fact, I'm convinced that a lot of the international issues that uh, we would like to put on our banner as having you know, been a success story are not yet truly success stories. But just think if we hadn't been there. You know, The community of Sant'Egidio in, in Italy, for example, uh, has been involved in peacemaking in a number of African countries, for example, and in working in Mediterranean, infra-Mediterranean immigration. They have some success stories to point to on the policy level. Uh, so uh, we are trying to create the models that various countries can use to apply to their situations, calling upon us as resource persons, using the web, the materials that we've got out there, and using the contacts, the network of leadership that uh, makes some of these decisions possible. We do say that. Yeah, I, th I think um, uh, in the social dimension of it, uh, I believe that the interfaith uh, work, uh, you know, succeeded. And I mentioned the example of the anti-torture movement, and I can give you other two examples. For example, the Cover the Uninsured Week. Uh, the Muslim community partnered with the interreligious uh, organizations here, and they are doing a great job to help the more than 40 million Americans that are not insured. Uh, other, um, you know, initiative also the Muslim community engage with, uh, you know, the Children Defense Fund, also just to cover the uninsured children. So I think in the social dimension of it, the interfaith or interreligious uh, help a great deal uh, to the nation. But it's in, in the political side of it, I mean, there are serious challenges are, are facing the interreligious organization. Uh, for example, I just give you one example. We have an organization called NILI, National Interreligious Initiative for Peace in the Middle East, um, is struggling to reach to the kind of uh, um, uh, solution or kind of uh, at least a level of agreement and they have been meeting actually with the administration um, several times but yet to see an obvious fruits of that kind of interreligious uh, you know um, um, uh, initiative or interreligious work. You see a very interesting footnote uh, question on that. I had an occasion about 20 years ago to interview Rabbi Mayer Kahana mm -hmm who was on that day debating uh, uh, Congressman Pete McCloskey in San Francisco. I happened to be there and then I asked for an interview, he granted me an interview. And he said people have a misconception, they think that Jews and Arabs, he didn't say Muslim Arabs are fighting with each other because they don't know each other. 
and therefore they want to bring us together in interfair dialogue that will create mutual knowledge and that will create mutual reconciliation. He said our problem is we have known each other too long and we know each other too well. Mm. All right. So to what extent can we say, and I don't mean in any disrespectful way just to understand the scope and the real possibilities, to what extent we can say that there are limits to interfaith dialogue, what it can and cannot accomplish in terms of international disputes like Palestine and Israel dispute? Well, I think, I mean, I think um, there is a huge mistrust um, in the Muslim world uh, because of this uh, conflict in, uh, in the Middle East. Um, exa <coughs> example of that, um, just a couple of weeks ago when we hosted these uh, scholars and writers from the Middle East, um, I invited uh, our friend Rabbi Hirschfeld to come from New York and meet with him, and he did. Um, most of these scholars, there were 16 of them, most of them never met a Jew before, never uh, met a rabbi before. And he asked them to ask a tough questions. Whatever question they have, you just ask. Um, so I think the idea is bringing even this group of scholars from the Middle East with a rabbi uh, from New York. I think there is huge disagreement in several issues. But to sit together and listen to each other uh, point of view, I think it is also it's a great uh, success. I, I didn't see. want to, I didn't want to interrupt you, but you <laughs> Palestinians who are the real party meet Jews on a daily basis. So we cannot take people from Egypt and apply them as a model to Palestinians. And no Egyptian is in a position to make a decision on behalf of the Palestinians. Let's be very clear about that. Even some of the Palestinians' leaders are not in a position to make decision on behalf of the Palestinians. We saw clearly. And Chairman Arafat, when he had told President Clinton, if, he were, if I were to sign away East Jerusalem, I'll be killed by my own brother, I think was telling the truth. So therefore, it's not the question that Palestinians who are occupied by the Israelis don't know the Israelis, they know. So what is, where does interfaith dialogue enter into that picture? Well, well go ahead. If I can say something. Uh, you know, the, the kind of cynical approach here is something like this, where a person will say, uh, religion, and this was an actual quote from a Palestinian Christian a number of years ago, religion exists to keep people apart, not to bring them together, all right? As if that was a settled matter, axiomatic, right? And so the point that he was trying to make was that our very identity depends on our religion, so if we lose our religion, we lose our identity, and then what, you know? So there's a kind of a feel, feeling that the one is on a precipice, and uh, you're at risk. So naturally there's a clinging to uh, formulas, uh, this kind of thing. Now the interreligious dialogue process, uh, when it has worked in conflict, conflict resolution, has shown people how they can maintain their identities with full dignity and full force without losing the possibility of working together uh, in those areas that absolutely require a political consensus to, to, to move forward. The, the problems of the Palestinian people cannot be summarized in a, in a few minutes uh, in our interview today. They're enormously complex. Uh, we both worked with, all of us have worked with people right. on both sides of the conflict. Uh, we know that this is a long process that will require politics of identity and also politics of consensus. And working with that is like walking a tightrope. But eventually, it will, it will have to pay, out, pay off. And if you exclude the religious communities, if you exclude the religious leaders, you will never get to the point of consensus. Exactly. Yeah. You see? This has been a problem in many places. I think that the, in my own personal opinion about why Iraq has been such a huge problem is because from the beginning, did not consider strategically the role of religious communities right. in this right. whole process. Right. Well, that is, we will come back to that. We'll come back to the issue of role of the religious leaders particularly the issue of substituting Muslim leaders in the United States for the religious leaders in Palestine and thinking this is going to work. We'll continue this discussion with our colleagues when we get back after a short break. Thank you. Welcome back to Global Forum. We are discussing with our panelists the issue of interfaith, interreligious dialogue and communication. And now that we have two panelists, we just have one more per, uh, friend of ours, Dr. Ahmed al who will join us, who is the National Vice Chair of CARE. He's also a professional 
engineer, also host of a television program, a man with many hats, and also has been engaged with Interfair Dialogue for the last 15 years, particularly in the state of Ohio. Welcome to you. Thank you. And you have been doing this for, I think, another 15, 20 years, so we have 40 years of experience sitting here. What can young Muslims learn from both of you in terms of what your enterprise has been? First of all, tell me briefly why each of you chose this path, what were the reasons you went into this, and what are your <coughs> summary observations of this process? Well, uh, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Uh, interfaith dialogue is not about conversion, first of all. It is about understanding. And as, as you all know, uh, since September 11th, we realize that Islam is the most misunderstood religion, not only in the United States, rather around the world. So we realize that we, as Muslims, have not done a good job in explaining our Islam, in reaching out to people out there, and educating them about Islam. Hence, we are being faced with, with tremendous misunderstandings, and when uh, CARE conducted a survey or a poll a couple of years ago, and when people were asked about their uh, uh, perception about Islam and Muslims in the United States, we only found, unfortunately at the time, only 2% had positive views of Islam and Muslims, 32% negative views of Islam and Muslims, and the balance, about 66%, were neutral. 18 months later, we did the same survey, and we found 6% uh, positive views, three times as much, and 26% negative views. And uh, uh, how, although Islam has been in this country for hundreds of years, why are we at this low level of understanding? And when people were asked about the first thing that comes to mind when they hear about Islam and Muslims, some of the comments were Muslims hate life, Muslims do not appreciate their children, Muslims uh, disrespect women, and that kind of thing. Yet all this is contrary to, to what reality is. So I guess we take the blame as Muslims that we have not done a good job for the past many, many years in educating people about who we are. So from that angle, I guess this is a, a very long lead to, to answering the question. I think we owe it to ourselves, at least from self-preservation, to, to, to engage ourselves in the dialogue, in the interfaith dialogue, so at least people will understand who we are. Obviously. Oh, good. Well, I see the interfaith actually dialogue or interfaith activities uh, right now within the Muslim community is a natural development and growth for the Muslim community. Uh, in the past, the Muslim community, of course, engaged in building mosques or Islamic schools uh, to keep the identity and things like that. But now the community realized that uh, building bridges and creating alliances within their neighbors is something that's very important. And that's actually what brought ISNA to uh, take a decision, even opening an office for interfaith and community alliances in Washington, D.C., to focus on interfaith relations and interfaith projects. And these projects, they might be, they are um, national in their nature, but they are for local implementation. So that's what we are trying to, uh, uh, to do. But in terms of doing this interfaith outreach, as uh, Dr. Akras was saying, one has been trying to remove the misunderstanding about Islam. To what extent Muslim community has learned about the other faiths, Christians or Hindus or Buddhists or Sikhs? Because it, it seems by definition it has to be a two-way street. To what extent we are traveling on the other side of the street? Yeah, that's actually true. Um, we, I can give you just one example. Our relationship with the National Council of Churches. It is a very strong relationship, and I can maybe mention other, um, you know, examples, you know, um, but we have a joint project with the National Council of Churches called God is One. So this is a two-way street. The purpose of this project is actually to um, educate the pastors and the priests about Islam. And, and the priests, they can do a study circle within their churches and within their localities, and they invite imams to join them, um, uh, just to talk about you know, mutual understandings. Then they can go to the mosque and also talk about uh, issues 
uh, has to do with the Christianity, and so that the Muslim community also has to understand the, Christ the, the Christianity also. But it seems to me, I'll concede you one second, it seems to me just at a very superficial level that people who come from churches and other religious institutions, they have far better knowledge of Islam, at least you know, in terms of the basics, vocabulary, sensitivities, sensibilities, than Muslim interlocutors going into the same dialogues about Catholicism or about Hinduism or about you know, any other Sikhism or Buddhism and so on and so forth. Why is that? Well, it is, the answer is pretty simple, is that the Muslim community, as I mentioned earlier, is engaged in developing the community, building their worship, worship places, um, and Islamic school to keep their kids' identity. So they did not, you know, get a chance to, to, to deal with their neighbors or to, you know, to study these kind of things. But now it is a time, and we are doing that right now. And when times comes, I'm pretty sure they will have reasonable understanding for the Catholicism and other. Well, Mr. Sinossi, isn't it true, again, I'll question you once is it true that many Muslims who came from Middle East or South Asia went to Catholic schools, missionary schools? Elites, by and large, in the Muslim world were trained by Catholic and missionary schools. I myself went to formal Christian college before I went to St. Mary's and then St. Joseph and so on and so forth. So why is it that decades of education in Christian institutions did not prepare Muslims to be knowledgeable about the faiths that they are dialoguing about? Is it something that needs to be critically examined as a matter of attitude, where we by and large go and prepare to these discussions, and we, assume, we turn always these two-way streets into one-way street and not do our homework? Well, I mean, doing our homework is something that is very essential, and we should do that. But even people like you and other people who went to this uh, Christian schools, they actually engage in the community affairs. Um, leader like you and others, they engage in the community affairs that has to do with, uh, they don't see learning the Catholicism or Christianity as a priority, but they see other things as a priority. Uh, building the Islamic center or building the Islamic school or uh, solving issues for new immigrants uh, because our community is not established yet. So those actual issues um, actually took most of the time for leaders like yourself and not focusing and educating our community about how imp important it is to know uh, well the, religious, the religion of your neighbor. So well, I'll, I'll answer this on, on two uh, fronts. One is uh, we believe in all the prophets before Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. We believe in Isa and Musa and uh, Jacob, uh, Yaqub and, and and Adam and Noah and all all, all all these all these prophets. So so from from that angle, we I, I think Muslims did not feel that they need to learn more about these other religions because we already believe all this is a very simplistic <laughs> answer. But it's a, but I think it's a defensible answer. Correct. But I, I think I agree with you. We have not done a good job because we are not threatened to a, to a larger extent by them. The other way around is, is, is the true. Basically, they feel that they are threatened by Muslims, hence they start learning about Islam. I agree with you, it's got to be two-way street, it's got to be that we learn about them, instead of just inviting them to our mosque, that we go to their churches and learn about their religion. So there, there's no, uh, I guess there's no good excuse uh, saying that, that we believe in all other religions, we need to get engaged and it is a two-way street. Would you say that now we have with the advent of the internet, <laughs> a semi-interfaith dialogue by way of e-groups and blogs and other things, you know, where it's not structured in, a, in any kind of symmetrical and a consistent fashion as an interreligious dialogue, but nonetheless it's taking on the form of interreligious dialogue. It may be 20 people of one faith, one person of another faith, or, you know, some other combination. True. Yet it requires that, uh, that character and that quality. What's going on in these blogs and what's going on in these e-groups? Do you have any sense of that? Well, um, th there is there is a lot of actually. I'm I'm just amazed to see a lot of initiatives by the Muslim community, even the younger the, the young group actually, MSA and MINA. Um, they're doing a lot of blogs and chatting groups. I mean, I, just last week, um, uh, there is a family actually in Los Angeles. Uh, I just forget the name, but they're 
Jewish family, but they are actually engaged in interfaith, and they wanted to uh, to have the Muslim community to engage with them, and actually they are doing interfaith in the high schools, and they have a group of Muslim young uh, students uh, contributing to their block, and 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 and, 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 and you know bringing their point of view and how important the interfaith and things like that. I think they were going to have a booth in the Isna Convention actually. Uh, so I think this kind of efforts is pretty good to prepare the masses. This is, this is great. I guess we need to also realize that uh, engaging uh, ourselves and our youth in the interfaith should not mean that we uh, drop our understanding of our own religion. We need to understand that there are differences between Muslims, Christians, Jews, Buddhists, and that kind of thing, and that we are proud of, of our own heritage and our own religion, even if we get engaged with, with others. So, uh, But w w one important thing that obviously follows logically from this uh, previous uh, notes, what is the agenda items on these interfaith blogs? What are people discussing? Are they comparing their notion of how life began or how life will end, death, birth, marriage. After all, there must be some kind of a convergence or, or, or converging item that makes a shorter list of agenda items. I'm, I'm not very privy to, to these discussions on the blogs, but I guess for a long time the most discussed items are the, the current items, that uh, the jihad concept and, and uh, uh, the relationship with other religions and that kind of thing. Uh, I, I, and, and I guess rightly so, these need to be discussed and these need to be uh, uh, educated upon by, by, by Muslims to others. Uh, I, I, I guess for, for the longest time, I've, I've been uh, privy to these discussions, again, about the concept of jihad and war and peace and the relationship of Muslims with other Muslims and that kind of thing. Now, keep in mind, Islam uh, commanded us to do the dialogue. It commanded us to do the interfaith dialogue. It is part of da'wah, in fact. The whole concept of da'wah is the interfaith dialogue. Uh, do not dispute with the people of the book except by means better than mere disputation. And the best amongst you as, O oh mankind, we create you from a single pair of a male and female, and we made you into nations and tribes that you may know each other. Exactly. The best among you is the most righteous. Mm -hmm. So from, from, I mean, we are uh, moved into that direction of, of dialogue and, and interfaith. It is not so much to question the motivation of interfaith dialogue, but ascertain the skillfulness of engaging in that dialogue. I think that's the issue here. And at least be knowledgeable. For instance, you know, there are two distinguished interfaith uh, dialogue uh, uh, practitioners here, and I want to know what are the issues they think communities involved with. For instance, for instance, to me, it looks like one of the blogs on interfaith are focused on meaning of certain surah in the Quran, which is good at one level because it may explain certain things. On the other hand, it looks like it's not a dialogue; it is an interrogation of Islam, whereby one party is made to answer, the other party is there to question. So, for instance, I have not seen so far, maybe they are there, I am not saying they are not there, a comparison of the Christian notion of a just war with the notion of jihad, okay? Or a historical comparison of crusades, or what is happening in by way of colonial occupation the last 600 years continuing up to this point. So it is not a dual critique where both sides are subject to critique without privileging either side, it's critique of one in the name of dialogue. Correct. Is that an issue that you see as happening and if so, what's the... What yeah, I mean, uh, you know, for example, with the, with the, with the, with the Catholic Church, for example, um, there is a book actually is going to be unfailed uh, pretty soon. That book actually discusses many issues, uh, including the issue of violence okay. uh, from the Catholicism perspective and from Islam. Um, what are the, uh, how, how violence viewed in both uh, religion? I think this kind of books it might be a resource for the for, for the community. Uh, but but I think uh, I, I want to go to the political aspect of it and how in interfaith and interreligious and building this relationship is very crucial for the Muslim community. I will give you an example you might not heard of before. Um, three years ago, when Senator Grassley, the chairman, the pre previous chairman of the uh, Senate Finance Committee, 
and issued a letter and asked the IRS to submit record for 26 or 25 Islamic organizations, including Islam. By the way, the number was actually the number was 200, but it was stated in the media as 26. Okay. So, 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 so he, he wanted that from the IRS. Our relationship with Bob Edgar, the current Secretary of the National Council of Churches, uh, he sent a letter. He, he, he's a previous congressman, he's a former congressman. He sent a, le a letter to, to his colleague in, in the Congress telling them that if you are asking ISNA to submit a record, I am ready to send you trucks of record for the National Council of Churches for the last 50 years. This kind of position is very crucial for us as a Muslim community and because of that great relationship he was able to do this for the Muslim community. Well, well, I guess the point you, you, you are alluding to is, is very true. That unfortunately this interfaith dialogue at one point over the past several years, because let, let, let's be uh, honest with ourselves, it, it really intensified over the past six years only in, in, in this country. And there's been almost kind of an interrogation of Islam and the standard of Islam is a certain issue, the issue of women in Islam, the issue of jihad, the issue. And I think it behooves us as Muslims is to turn it around. Yes, we agree because there's nothing to hide about the issue of jihad, the issue of women, the issue of all these issues. But we need to ask the questions. What is the issue of, of occupation also in, in all religions? In Islam, uh, Judaism, uh, Christianity and that kind of thing. The issue of, as you uh, mentioned, just war versus this current war that is taking place. Where do these religions stand on this? And, and there's nothing to be ashamed of. We Muslims are ready to, uh, to discuss these things. I think we have not been the ones who set the agenda for the interfaith dialogue. And I think this is a, a, a shortcoming on our part. I think uh, we have not been engaged in, in interfaith dialogue for a long time. Now we are learning. We're the new kid uh, on the block. I think we need to turn it around and start discussing the issues of, of, of the moment. These are the issues that must be discussed in addition to jihad, in addition to women, in addition to, to the verse of the sword, in addition to all these things that need to be discussed on equal uh, footing. I agree with you. Yeah, but we have to understand, Dr. Akhir, is that uh, there are certain issues that, um, intellectual issues, the issue of jihad, you know, uh, issue of terrorism, and these kind of issues, we need the Muslim scholars and to get together and produce a document, you know, intellectual document from the religious perspective. They are certain issues that can be discussed and can be implemented by the masses, by the Muslim community, and those are the, uh, you know, with the interfaith community, you can implement certain projects. So I think we have to differentiate, differentiate between two of them. Well, I think the differentiation I was seeking from you was, should the interfaith dialogue be based on a notion of dual critique, dual, simultaneous, inter critique of the self and the other, without privileging either, or should it be a one-way street where you submit yourself for further interrogation so you can be socially accepted and the people who have the power to remove the stigma from your forehead can remove, do so, all right? They're two different things. And the second is, can anybody empower or authorize himself or arrogate to himself or herself the ability to do so if they're not done homework, if they're not produced a scholarship and knowledge? Those are the questions I'm asking. It's not the question of desirability, it's the question of skill and doing the job we need to do in that regard. So it has become a one-way street, what was supposed to be two-way street. <coughs> but let me ask you the question, from both of your experience point of view, which groups have you been engaged with in terms of interfaith dialogue? What groups have you engaged in? Well, I mean, we have actually several projects at okay. the Islamic Society of North America. With the Protestant, for example, okay. represented by the National Council of Churches, we have several projects. We have uh, regular meetings and things like that. I mentioned one project is a God is One project. Um, in the fall, actually, within ISNA annual convention, um, we are hosting a Christian to come to our annual convention and to do uh, programs there and the National Council of Churches and the Presbyterian Church USA actually they are taking leads on this. With the Catholic, with the United States, you know, conference of the, of the Catholic bishops, uh, we have, um, you know, dialogue going on for the last nine years uh, discussing, you know, certain issues with other uh, group, with, uh, with the Church's Center for Theology and Public Policy. 
it is also a Presbyterian Center. We have also uh, joint projects actually we're working on. One of them is the uh, Muslim Christian Initiative on the Nuclear Weapons Danger. Uh, other interreligious projects that we're working on it is the National Religious Campaign Against Torture. And ISNA actually is a founding member of this organization. And as I mentioned previously, the organization has grown. I mean, we have 120 participating members, including the Evangelical and Southern Baptist and other, other you know, notable groups. And that's very impressive, and I applaud you and other colleagues for doing this thing. But if I notice it correctly, most of the interfaith dialogue is Christian Muslim dialogue or occasionally Christian Muslim Jewish dialogue, right? Now, I'll concede to you in one second, uh, there is a very big issue with the Hindu community. Right. There is a potential issue with some of the elements of the Buddhist community uh, in different contexts. So, is it a correct impression on my part, we are only engaged with those communities who actually took the initiative to seek us out and almost coach us into playing the role that we are playing with them and those who did not do it, we didn't do it with them. Well, I think, I, I think, I mean, as uh, Ahmed mentioned, is that the idea of interfaith or interreligious dialogue or interreligious projects for the Muslim community is pretty new for the last just few years. And I think the time will come that the Muslim community would also engage in other uh, religious communities, the Hindu and the Buddhist and, and other. Um, and we started doing that, actually. We started with the Jewish community. We had. Um, a program in the last year annual convention. Fifteen Jewish leaders came from across the nation and met with the fifteen Muslim leaders for the whole day and just to talk about issues and come up with a plan called 4042, you know, to implement the specific projects. So this is just the beginning, but, uh, but our hope is that to engage all the segments of the religious community in the interfaith uh, programs. Well, we, uh, Aga, we need to differentiate between the national and the local levels. Uh, but I agree with you. I guess, I guess uh, we are not engaged across the board with everybody. In fact, even among Muslims, Christians, Jews, sometimes based on the issue, you start seeing only uh, just dual dialogue between Muslims and Christians, for example, or otherwise. Because when it becomes touchy a little bit, when you start talking about issues, although they have the religious connotation to them, but issues of the day, whether it's the occupation or otherwise, uh, some of our friends in other faiths they, they cease to, to come to, to, uh, to these dialogues uh, when, when you talk about the, the issue of the war in Iraq, in Iraq or the issue of Palestine or, or certain issues, it, it becomes an issue that is divisive, unfortunately, rather than uh, bringing people together. But I agree with you, we need to engage with others. At the local level, I think it is better than the national level. Uh, at the local level, uh, you'll find the dialogue with the uh, Buddhists and with the uh, Sikh and with the Hindus and with the Christians and, and with the Jews and that kind of thing. Uh, I think we need to do a better job in, in working these one-on-one uh, uh, -on -one dialogue and collective dialogue. Uh, we have, uh, certain times, we invited the whole uh, interfaith community to dialogue about certain issues and we found some representatives of certain religions uh, did not show up and did not come, making a political statement. Although, as, as, as you alluded in the beginning, uh, this interfaith dialogue should break these uh, barriers. Uh, barriers and allow us to, to start speaking freely. Uh, <laughs> but Dr. here's the issue. Again, correct me please, because you are the direct practitioners. practitioners, I'm only a distant observer. It seems to me that the dialogue with Muslims, by mostly the Christian and sometimes the Jewish community, is invariably linked with demands for internal reform. Be that on the issue of women, on the issue of civil liberties, minority treatment, so and so forth. What is happening right now in the United States is demonize their congregations against Islam, demonizing Islam the same way they were doing communism 20 years ago. Why is it that Muslims do not go to their Christian interlocutors or from Jewish interlocutors or in the group and say, as you 
expect us to create greater understanding and tolerance and acceptance of diversity, not only accept it but to celebrate it, which we recognize as a valid demand or valid expectations, you should be doing the same. Why is there no understanding being sort of achieved in that order, on that level? Well, do you reckon, first of all, do you do you agree that there is there are churches that are doing this thing? I I I certainly do, yes. and I think it reflects on on us and how strong we are. I think we sometimes we cave in, and we are trying to please, and I think we need to stand up for who we are, and I think we need to stand up for for the truth, and enjoy what is right and forbid what is evil and wrong. We should not cave in, we should not be apologetic on our stands, and this is Islam, and this is our religion, and these are our stands. I, I agree with you. We, uh, for, for, for some time, at least in the past few years, we were trying to, to please or trying to, to find a common ground so we can be accommodated. I think maybe for, for that time it was okay, but now it is time for us to stand up and, and say the way it is. This is what Islam is all about. And we are going to deal on even keel with everybody and, and demand that, that uh, we are treated as much as we treat, uh, similar to what we treat others. Well, I think, I think the, the Muslim community still need to really um, um, understand the interfaith or interreligious work very well. And I think there is an effort has been made. There is a recent book actually published just last month about the interfaith dialogue written by Dr. Muhammad, Imam Muhammad Shafiq and Dr. Muhammad Abu Nimr. Uh, we have uh, it's available. We can you know provide you with copies. So I think that is a good document uh, to as a guide to the Muslim community how to do the interfaith dialogue. Um, yes, there are some churches that there is also deal with why to do interfaith dialogue or only how. Uh, it's the guide, how and why and things like that, to do interfaith dialogue. There are certain churches, of course, they um, they are they wanted to demonize Islam. There's no doubt. And the recent book actually called Islamic Imperialism. I'm sure you heard about that book. That several thousand were sent to uh, to the churches, the priests for free, um, just talking about Islam. So. We, as a Muslim community, we need to organize ourselves. We have to have a body that intellectually can look into this literature and come up with a document no, no, hang on, hang on. that can be... Hang on. Yes, that will be a response from Muslims in terms of attack on them. Mr. Professor Mahmoud Mamdani, author of Good Muslim and Bad Muslim, makes a very good point. He says, when you attack Islam, that speech is seen as part of free speech. When you attack other religions or when you question Holocaust, when it happened or not, that is seen act of bigotry. So there are two totally different classifications, therefore two totally different public responses. So I'm not asking you how Muslims can better uh, sort of, you know, uh, uh, deal with these things. That's a separate issue and a valid one. But I'm asking you is what is the expectation from partners in dialogue when their member, community members attack Islam in totally unacceptable manners? as they expect for us to sort of you know rein in those imams and those sermons exactly. that are sort of you know, seen as beyond the pale of reason and beyond the pale of mutual acceptance. Why is that we are not making the same demand of that? We, I, I think we should. I think this is the time of truth for us and for them. Yep. I think for, for again for the last several years we were trying to to dance around the issues. Right now I think we should not be apologetic exactly the same way. When you demand of our imams to speak in a certain way, we demand of, of these religious figures to speak in a certain way. It goes both ways. It is not just one way street. And, and we are not, uh, to me, I, again, to me, I think we should not be apologetic anymore. I think we should stand for our rights because these are our rights. We need to stand for it and we need to call it for whatever it is. This is bigotry. It cuts both sides. Right. Freedom of speech. It cuts both, both sides. sides. Exactly. Yeah, but I think. Last word to you. Yeah, I, I think what's happened is that uh, you remember when Yari Farwell made a statement about the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. The National Council of Churches they issued a document. They issued a statement, you know, um, denouncing what happens and saying that this is wrong. 
And I think this kind of positions and stance are very crucial for the Muslim community coming from the main Protestant organization. Uh, talking directly on behalf of the Muslim community is something that uh, should be really commended. I, I fully agree with you, but I don't think they were speaking on behalf of the Muslim community. They were speaking on behalf of those Christians who think these attacks are unjustified. And that's very good, but the attacks on Islam and Muslims are ongoing, not one-day basis. While I fully recognize and respect what they did, and you correctly pointed out, I think that's only a, a sort of drop in the bucket that needs to be recognized as a drop. We have the issue of reform in religions, an issue of need to continue to work with each other and respect each other. Every community is in need of reform and must do it. Muslims are in error in many places. But we must differentiate between Muslim states and the religion of Islam. Muslims need many corrections and we should have the courage to recognize our mistakes, our errors, our weaknesses, our shortcomings and find creative ways to fix them. At the same time we should have the courage of conviction to stand up for our faith and demand dignity, respect and understanding that we all deserve as human beings. We should be, very, we should be the first to challenge any oppression against any minority in the Muslim world and we should also be the first in this country to stand up for our civil liberties, our human rights, our religious rights. This is a dialogue we will continue with our learned friends here and elsewhere. Thank you.